So I've recently been introduced to our new speaker, our next speaker. Um, well, welcome back. It is 3.40 in this particular time zone. Don't know where my brain is, but that's fine. We're here to hear from Dave Smith Uchida, and he is speaking on custom resources, resource-based APIs. And here we go, Dave. Thank you. OK, is my mic work? Yeah, cool. Um, thank you for coming. Um, I'm Dave Smith Uchida. I work for Cast and by Veeam. Uh, Ali Doware also uh, co-authored the presentation, but unfortunately, he can't make it here. Um, I've been working with Kubernetes, I don't know, four years now, I think. Uh, I spent some time as the Valero lead and um, doing a lot of data protection stuff. So I've built several custom resource-based applications at this point. And I uh, wanted to take a look through what, you know, building a custom resource based, if, if it's the right approach for you. There we go. Okay, so just a quick, some of the stuff I want to cover here. We'll talk about what it is, some examples, uh, declarative APIs, which are tricky to get right, a little on security parallelism performance, some ways you can implement uh, an application. Um, we put together a little example with a CI CD pipeline and uh, then data protection, which is near and dear to my heart, and then some conclusions. Okay, so what is a custom resource based API? So, this is one where your application needs a way to interact with something, but it doesn't actually provide an API endpoint. So, there's no REST, no gRPC being provided by your application. Instead, clients will talk to your application via changes to Kubernetes resources. Uh, these could be custom resource definitions. That's a pretty common one. Uh, it's possible there's another path called an aggregated API server. I'll cover how that works later on. And you can even just do things with like, say, config map. You can write out config maps of certain types and have your application watching for those. So how does a, a, an application like this work? So this is pretty much the standard Kubernetes model. So it's going to, so the, your client, you know, or user changes the resource to reflect what they want. That's your desired state. And then the controller, your application, is going to look at what's out there in the Kubernetes resources, look at the state of the world, and try and bring the two in, uh, into sync. That's the basic idea, this reconciliation. And then it'll update the resources with the status of the real world. And that's how you find out what the state of the world as the application thinks it is. Um, and of course, there's relentless forward progress, which means that your controller should keep retrying things. You say you want something done, it hits an error. It should retry this periodically until it eventually gets there. And that may allow you to, for example, fix other things in the system so that things can, can work. So there's um, some patterns we've seen so far of applications that use this pattern. Um, so I'm going to split out the idea of a Kubernetes operator. In my terminology, I narrow it a little bit because you'll see some definitions that are basically any, car any custom resource-based application is an operator. I narrow it down a little bit to say that it's really something that is managing resources for you and being controlled via Kubernetes. So an example of this would be a database operator like the Postgres, you know, multiple Postgres operators, where you tell the operator, I want a Postgres database, and it does the work of creating the database, but your application, the operator, isn't the database. So it's not actually providing the service that it's managing. That's a very common pattern. Um, if you are implementing an operator, then by definition, you're going to be doing custom resources. So we're not going to go into the pros and cons there because you've already decided that you want to be able to manage a service via Kubernetes. Uh, a lot of things we see are system utilities, uh, backup, backup apps, for example. Um, and these, you're controlling the application via CRs. So this is really the, the, um, the model of an application, but these tend to be very uh, Kubernetes linked and very and specific to like controlling or protecting Kubernetes. But the, the model of the application is pretty much the model of a general purpose application. And then there's general purpose applications. And 
when we did the proposal, we're like, oh, hey, lots of people must be doing these. And then, you know, we did the proposal, and then it's like, hey, you're accepted. Hey. And so we looked, and it's like, actually, not that many people are doing that. But um, it's, we're going to talk about, you know, some examples of things you might build. And I suspect there's an awful lot of things that are internal that we don't see, you know, when you Google for, uh, for applications. But, you know, so an example of this might be a CI CD pipeline that is controlled by Kubernetes resources. Um, we had a thought of doing something for like trading model testing where you could write a resource saying, hey, I want to test my new model. And the application goes, runs, spins up a few pods, runs your model for you, gets the results and puts it back there. So those are some, some possible things. I'm sure people will come up with other things. So there's, if you're putting things together via Kubernetes, uh, declarative APIs are kind of the it's, the, it's the way when it comes to Kubernetes. And a declarative API is where you say, this is the way things should be. You declare that by writing it into the resource. And then the system's responsible for making reality match up with what you wanted. So your desired state and your actual state. This is really different than imperative APIs, which is what most of us worked with for a long time, where you say things like, do this. So for example, say we have a system that's managing a warehouse. You may have an imperative API that says, move box A to shelf five. When you make that call, it could be a REST call, it could be gRPC, it doesn't really matter. When you make that call, the system is going to go and do whatever work it needs to do to move the box to shelf five. When it gets there, when it either hits an error or it completes, it comes back to you and it says, hey, I did this. Now, in a declarative API, you're going to say, box, box A is on shelf five. And then, the, and then you kind of wander off. You can, you can watch it if you like. But the system's responsible for getting things onto shelf five, getting that box on there. And it may retry, you know, say for example, it's controlling a robot, the robot fell over, somebody fixed the robot, let's try it again. That's all happening in your reconciliation loop inside the controller. It's not the client watching and saying, hey, I told you to move it, oops, that failed. Okay, let's try it again, let me do an alert. That's, that's a big difference there. So when we go and implement these um, applications, it's pretty common to actually wind up where you, you put the actions in and you put them in as resources and you say, for example, like we might have a move box action resource. And it works, but there's a lot of pitfalls with it. So like in this example, we have say move box action, move box action. Each resource, so every time you want to move a box, you'll write a resource. You name the resource something, and it doesn't really matter what it's named, but it has to be unique, otherwise you're going to run over other things. And you put in the spec, you put what box you're moving and what shelf you're going to. And then the status would be updated with succeeded or failed, or you know, other error conditions. And so basically what you've done at this point is you've taken your RPC, and you've changed it to a different transport mechanism, and you're pushing it through Kubernetes resources. And this has a bunch of pitfalls if you do this. So things like order of execution. So five people wrote move box A somewhere. Which one goes first? Which one comes second? That's a question that you have to figure out. Um, where is the box? This resource doesn't tell you where the box is. It tells you an action that was taken, whether or not the action succeeded. But if you want to know where the box is, and you do it through the Kubernetes API, there's going to have to be a resource somewhere else that says box position that you can read. And then you wind up with, with cleanup. So since you're writing one of these resources for each action, they tend to proliferate. And they're not very useful after you've written them. So somebody needs to clean them up. However, they're also the way that you found out if this API call succeeded. So if you clean it up prematurely, the client doesn't see it. So say you have a long running application, it took an hour to move the box. Your client you know, wandered off, it's in its retry, you know, backed off a bit, and you clean up the resource, pick a time. Does it clean it up in five minutes, an hour, a day, whatever? You have to, you have to pick something there, and there's a point where you know, you know, it's always possible for the client to never have seen the result because the resource got cleaned up. Um, 
And then something's got to clean them up as well. So you have to write a little loop in your server, in your application, to go and clean things up at certain times. So even though this is the way, I'm going to tell you, no judgment. I've done this, right? So um, why did we do this? So for example, we had things that we wanted to expose user control, but we didn't want to build a new API endpoint, like a new REST endpoint that had to be exposed outside the cluster. We said, yeah, this is a, this is a utility. The user already has Kubernetes access, so we're going to run it through the resource things, even though this is kind of busted. Um, we've had things where we wanted to have a publish subscribe mechanism for running, uh, running operations. And it's like, yeah, it's easier to run it through the API server rather than writing our own mechanism for distributing things. So no judgment, but just be aware of this going in, that if you start writing these kind of actions, it looks simple at the beginning, but you've got to deal with all these other issues. So if we were to do the same example as a declarative API, instead you'd have a box resource. You have one of these for each box in the warehouse. You put a name, the, the name of the resource is the name of the box, and your spec is the shelf that, it's, is, that you want it to be on, and in the status you can have the shelf that it's actually on, and you can have some uh, conditions for what, what condition is the box in. Is it settled, is it moving, are we retrying it, et cetera. So why is this better? And, this is, and better is really in terms of better fits into Kubernetes, the Kubernetes model in this custom resource model. It's not declarative APIs are simply better than imperative APIs. But if you're doing this, if you're doing the Kubernetes model here, it's better so you've got the name of the resource identifies the box. Makes it a little simpler. Um, you didn't need to figure out what to name the resource. So you didn't have to worry about name collisions, which we did with the action, because each action had to be named separately. Um, order of execution. Whoever was the last writer, whatever is there in the resource is what's going to, where it's going to go. So if somebody writes, you know, three, then somebody else writes four, and somebody else writes five, it doesn't really matter. You can short circuit all that. You can go straight to five because you don't need to do all the intermediate things because you're not talking about, these are not actions. These are where I want it to be. So you can potentially telescope all the actions down together. Um, you only have one resource here. So you've got the resource that tells you what the position is and controls the position. So before we had an action resource and we would have wound up with a per box resource. And then your reconciliation in your controller is simpler because all you do is you look to see for, you look for differences and try to resolve differences. You don't have to worry about cleanup. You don't have to worry about order of execution. So given that you've done your API design in, um, and gotten your resources into Kubernetes, um, security is another standard issue. And I tend to say RBAC when I mean Kubernetes security. If you saw Ben's presentation before, there's a whole bunch of different ways that you can do Kubernetes security. But the key thing is that if you're going through this resource uh, model, you're leveraging all of the stuff out of Kubernetes in terms of security and so forth. And you get an existing security model. It may be a complicated one, but it's there. And people can, un you know, it's being studied and you can understand it. Authentication, you've delegated out to the API server, so you don't have to have authentication in your application. Now, the bad things from a security point of view is that your users need to have API server access. And in my opinion, I would not give out API server access to just anybody because there's just too, there's, there's just, it's not designed for it. It's kind of like giving users SSH to your Linux host. It's like, eh, I'm not going to do that. Um, you could potentially put a gateway in front that handles this, but then you've taken security back to yourself, so you're really not winning too much there. But assuming that you've gone ahead and done that, um, what are some patterns that you can do? So one way is you just put the, your app and the CRs in the same namespace. You give users who are allowed to use the app, you give them access to read and write these resources in the namespace, and you're done. Um, it's pretty easy to set up. Uh, it's a very coarse grain control, but you know, it depends on what you're doing. It may be just fine. Another way is you can, you can actually set RBAC rules on individual named resources. So you can say they can read and write these, this specific resource. Um, we've tried this and it almost works, but one of the problems that you have is things like discovery. If you don't know the name of the resource, 
you can't really list things out if we've limited the um, their if we've limited their access down. Another way to do this is you take the first model, but you add multiple namespaces, and then you limit access on a you know namespace access on like a per user basis. And this way, you know, they can just read and write, users can just read and write resources in the namespace that they're allowed to write to. Um, you'll see this pattern in a few places. This is something that uh, VMware was doing. Um, and this works out okay in, in some ways, but, um, you know, it makes it harder in your application because now you have to monitor for uh, changes in multiple namespaces. And you may want to do things like limit which namespaces the application is watching so that, Random people creating random namespaces can't suddenly start doing things. Um, and then you also have to be careful of these privilege escalation paths. And that's true everywhere, but um, we've been hitting it more in this namespace per user thing because often we'll have the controller running in one namespace. It has some resources in there that get um, referenced from individual namespaces. It's like, okay, how do I make sure that there's no way to, like, guess at a resource that I shouldn't be able to see and have the, the application do things on my behalf using a resource that they shouldn't be using. Okay, so we've gotten our security concerns out of the way. Um, one reason to do this is also it's a, you get a fairly easy parallelism model. So, you know, you've got multiple workers, you want work to come in, you want workers to work on things. And so we've got some different common patterns. One would be a dispatcher with multiple workers. That might be a load balancer or something. It's one way to do it, kind of hard. Uh, you might have a queuing system to send out, to distribute work out to the various workers. Or you can do publish and subscribe um, where various workers are watching for things. And the publish subscribe model actually fits in nicely with a CR-based application and with Kubernetes. So if you do that, how does that work? So that's, this has the advantage that you, you're leveraging the Kubernetes API server, the resources are all there. No extra code to do that. Um, you don't need a queuing system. You don't need a dispatcher. You can just have your workers contend on the resources. You need a locking mechanism. So you can lock a resource and if the resource is locked, then that worker works on it. Everybody else says, oh, it's locked, I'll leave it alone. And then the lock holder does the work and releases the lock. Um, the locks need to expire. So like, for example, if a worker crashes, then the lock should expire and then everybody should recontend on the resources and get back to work. Um, I've done this. This actually works out fairly nicely. Okay, so you've figured out all these other things. How about, you know, scale and, you know, what are your scale requirements and is this right for you? in terms of your scale requirements. So one of the big issues with the API server is it's just, it doesn't handle large numbers of resources well. So we're told, let's not do that. So if you have, you know, the warehouse example from earlier may not exactly be a very good one because most warehouses have more than a thousand boxes in there. So um, you have to look at how many resources you're planning to put into the API server before you start coding this because you don't want to have to go through and undo the whole thing. Uh, an aggregated API server can help with large numbers of resources. I'll go through a little of how that's built. Um, you really shouldn't have a large number of simultaneous clients to the API server. And then in terms of performance, just in terms of looking at this as an API transport, um, your basic operation for getting your application to do something turns into a whole bunch of stuff you have to write, the CR, which means you're doing an etcd write, then the controller has to be notified and wake up, then it, it actually does its work, then it has to update things back into the resource, which would be again an etcd write, and the client has to be woken up to read things. So we did some basic numbers on this to give you kind of a feel of this. These are not rigorous or ex extremely scientific, but they are a little interesting. So. We did, we did some stuff with a, we built a small application that's just a kind of a dummy that um, updates things. We use kubectl to write and uh, read resources for the application. We ran this in Google Cloud, pretty standard configuration, GPIO storage, three worker nodes, couple management nodes. And we measured things like how long does it take for things to happen? And I kind of thought they were bad, but this is actually worse than I expected. So 
your basic time here that we, that we measured was time to create a resource is about 270 milliseconds. And that's getting it down into etcd. And then the controller took some time to be woken up and to read the resource. That was an extra 400 milliseconds. Now you're actually doing work. In this case, we didn't do any. Um, but we just, we just wrote back that we were done. And so again, it took us 270 milliseconds to update the resource. And then it took another 400-ish milliseconds for the client to see the change. So without actually doing any work, we've already consumed 1.4 seconds. So this is, you know, and there's, there's areas where this is not a problem, but there's definitely areas where it is. So you really need to understand the performance that you need out of your API before you go into this. Because if you've got something that takes 50 milliseconds to execute, you'll probably be very unhappy going through this. So, um, you know, here at the middle, we can talk a little about, you know, what did we think about these APIs. So what's great about building something this way? It leverages all the Kubernetes stuff. You get the RBAC security, all of the, um, the operations, the CRUD operations are all done for you. Um, you can use existing clients and, you know, you can use kubectl, you can write, uh, you can use the Go client and put a wrapper around that. Got all kinds of great things there. Um, scaling your app is fairly easy. You know, if you follow the pattern, you know, you can run multiple controllers. You don't have to do too much in order to distribute work out across them. And one of the neat things is that because you've fully disconnected the client and the application, if the application goes down, clients can continue to modify resources. You know, as long as the, as long as the application comes back in a reasonable amount of time, the client never notices. So that's, that's some cool stuff. Um, on the bad side, well, number one is you are now tied to Kubernetes. So if you think that you're going to switch to some other system for building and running things, you're going to have to redo your API. Uh, the declarative API doesn't always work. You may look at it for a long time and go, eh, it's just not going to work for me. Um, number of resources, again, you know, that's an issue. And performance can be a very big issue for you. So we've now gone ahead, we've decided that we looked at all of these issues, we said, yes, we're going to go on ahead and do it this way. Now, how do you actually build something like this? So there's two common ways to do this. Uh, one is to use custom resource definitions and controllers. And this is good. So you're, basically your schema is there in the CRD. You register it with Kubernetes, with the API server, and that allows you to read and write resources. And you just run the controller. It talks to the API server. It sees things changing. It's pretty easy to implement. Now, another way to do this is with the aggregated API server, where you actually write a server, and I'll go into a little more detail on this, that serves your resources. And that gets you around some of the issues with uh, performance and scale. And, and so in general, you know, one of these two approaches will work for you. And uh, CRDs are easier to implement. Aggregated API servers, probably better for large numbers of resources and performance. So. We decided to go ahead and do this as a controller CRD. This is pretty much the most common model for this. So what would you do? Um, you create your CRD, all your custom resources are stored in the Kubernetes API server. And they're stored in etcd and et cetera. And the controller is just running there, it runs in a controller loop, and it re reconcile loop, it watches resources, and then it tries to do things based on the changes in resources. So great things about this, persistence, Kubernetes. Storage of your resources. Kubernetes. It's the same thing, actually. But API endpoints. Kubernetes handling those for you. Security. Well, securities we're going to get in either case. Um, again, your client and application are fully disconnected. If this controller goes down for, you know, a few seconds, you probably will never notice. I mean, it's taken us 1.4 seconds just to get a round trip on the, on the resource. So if your controller's down for a few seconds, you probably won't notice. There's a lot of stuff available to help you. There's like the operator SDK to build out this um, controller. Now the cons of this are, so say for example, you have a large, a large number of resources out, outside of Kubernetes that you want to represent in Kubernetes. Now you've got to sync, and especially if those are modifiable outside the system. Now you've got to be syncing these things into Kubernetes, and that gets kind of painful. 
Um, performance, as we noted, you know, the whole write to etcd, controller wake up, okay. Um, kind of kills you there. Let's see if we can move this along. So an aggregated API server. Uh, this is one where your aggregated API server actually uh, handles the resources for you. So it implements a API end endpoint. You give that to the API server. Whenever a call comes in, whenever a REST call comes in, uh, Kubernetes delegates that out to the aggregated API server. And that's a lot harder to implement, but you're going to get better performance in some cases. You can uh, spew resources out and so forth through there. But on the other hand, you've got to do all of the work. So again, your pros, you didn't store the, the resources in etcd. Uh, if you have things that you just want to expose into Kubernetes as records, resources, you don't have to sync, right? When you do like a list or a get, it can go directly to the backend system. And if you're executing ex uh, operations here, the controller doesn't need to be notified. It can just have some hooks internally. Bad things, it's a lot harder to implement. Um, you're, you're, you've now connected your client and server a lot more closely. If the Aggregated API server goes down, those resources are not going to get served. You can't make modifications to them. You've got a dispatch problem and all of your persistence. The pro is it's not NetCD, the con is it's not NetCD. You've got to handle that. Okay, so a quick look at a possible example application where we're doing a CI CD pipeline. We have three resources pipeline, build, and deployment. So the pipeline resource would define a pipeline. That is, watch a git repo, watch for these tags, look for new commits here. When those happen, build them. And the way it builds them is it goes ahead and creates a build uh, resource, and it goes ahead and creates a deployment resource. So the pipeline is responsible for watching for things and telling the rest of the system to build and deploy. So that's all it needs to do. It just watches git and it watches Kubernetes. Then you can have a build controller. It's watching build resources. And when it sees a build, a build object, it can look in the, um, in this case, we're building Docker artifacts. It can look in Docker and go, huh, do I have artifacts that match this build? Yes or no? No? Okay, well, I'll go ahead and build that. It can go ahead, do git pull, build, test, and push that out to the, to the registry. Then we've got the deployment controller. And this can also be watching. Um, so it's watching for the builds. And it's saying, okay, here's a build that I haven't deployed. I'm supposed to deploy this thing. It's watching the deployment objects, really. It can say, okay, I need to deploy these, this build. When that build is ready, I'll deploy it. So that lets your flow be the user creates a pipeline resource. The pipeline controller is watching Git and generating build and deploy resources. The build controller is watching build, doing builds and creating artifacts. And the deployment controller is watching deployments and deploying things for builds. You have three separate resources. Now, one of the neat things about this is that the, everything's fully disconnected. And you can, for example, simply create a build resource that didn't come out of a pipeline. And that can trigger the build controller to go off and do things. You can trigger a deployment resource that you can build, you create a deployment resource that doesn't have anything to do with the pipeline. It needs to have a build. So one thing to look at there. All right, I'm ready the home stretch here. Um, so now that you've built your application, uh, data protection may come into play here. So if you have state in custom resources, you may need to protect them. So you really have to look at what will happen if I lose all of my custom resources. And if you do, you know, are you going to be in trouble? Um, so anything that's unique in Kubernetes and important to the running of your app probably needs to be backed up somewhere. Um, so one of the things we would ask is like on restore, it's basically a, um, a cold start, so you have to be able to handle that. Uh, restore ordering and stuff you need to think about and maybe expose to the backup application. Uh, pausing reconciliation is kind of nice, having an option to pause reconciliation on a server. Uh, really advanced applications can have backup and restore APIs. And doing your owner refs correctly so that we know which resources that belong to your application is good. And I believe, okay, so conclusions. Right now, mostly used for Kubernetes resources and system utilities. I think these are the conditions that if you're considering building this for an application, you know, you'd want to look at this. Is your dependency on Kubernetes acceptable? Is client access to Kubernetes acceptable? Can you fit your operations into the declarative model? You don't have to, but it's kind of nicer. 
relatively low volume of operations, large units of work per resource update. And your total number of resources represented should be, you know, relatively small. Okay. We have space. Oh, we're out of space. Burning questions. All right. Well, oh, one, Ben. I believe so. Can you repeat the question? Yeah, so can you apply the RBAC controls to aggregated API objects? I believe so. I believe that the um, API server is going to do that for you. But yeah, so that's a plus that you get. But Awesome. Well, big hand for Dave, and thank you. Thank you all for coming.